Welcome to the Austin School of Furniture podcast, brought to you by, well, the Austin School of Furniture. We're a fine furniture school in Austin, Texas, offering classes of all links to all woodworkers of all skill levels. Join the ASF staff as we talk furniture making, how to grow as a craftsperson, and interview incoming instructors. Thanks for listening. <laughs> You're the host. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right. Hi there, everybody, and welcome to an episode of the Austin School of Furniture podcast. Today with me, I have Matt Kenny, who's in town teaching a class on Kimiko, both an introduction class and an intermediate class. Uh, and really, we're just kind of finding out more about you and about what you're doing here and about the class and all things Matt Kenny. Well, not all things, hopefully. Of course, of but course. many things. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, what are you teaching while you're here in town? So, right now, I'm teaching uh, two classes. One of them was a three-day uh, Kumiko introduction to Kumiko class, where we made a really simple panel using the Asanoha pattern, and then we uh, have a two-day class over the weekend, which is like an intermediate class. We'll be making a slightly more complicated panel that involves not only the Asanoha pattern, but also another pattern that I call the hashtag. And we're going to spin the hashtag to 45 degrees. And uh, that should be fun. That one to be mo- a little more challenging mm-hmm. uh, than uh, the basic stuff that you normally learn in a, in a Kumiko class. Okay. And yeah, for those that don't know, what is Kumiko? So Kumiko is a Japanese art form that's been around for a very long time. You use strips of wood to create frames, and those frames can either have smaller squares in them, or sometimes the frames are made and they are hexagonal. Uh, And then inside the openings in the frame, you use uh, pieces of wood that you cut angles into to fit them together with friction and create patterns. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we should show one. Yeah, we probably should. Yeah. <laughs> this is Kumiko, and you can see there's a wooden frame. In this case, it's a square frame, and the pattern that is fitted into the smaller squares is called Asanoha, or the hemp leaf pattern, and all of those pieces are just held in place by friction. It's a really fun thing to do, and uh, it's always a fun class uh, to take and to teach, actually. Yeah. So how did you get into Kimiko first? Oh, back in 2015, I was working at Fine Woodworking Magazine. And I'm not sure exactly when, but at some point prior to that time, Fine Woodworking had run an article by the, about John Reed Fox, who's a furniture maker in Massachusetts. And he incorporates Kumiko into his furniture. Mm-hmm. And so there was like a back cover with one of John's uh, pieces of furniture on it. And then there was a short article showing how to make uh, the Asanoha pattern. One of my colleagues, Mike Pekovich, started to mess around with Kumiko. I saw what Mike was doing and it interested me. And so uh, one day he and I were talking and I started to think about how could I use Kumiko in this bunch of boxes that I was making at the time. I was trying to make 52 boxes over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, I could incorporate some Kumiko into what I was doing. And I ended up using it in two different little tea cabinets that I made during that time uh, that are in my first book, uh, 52 boxes in 52 weeks. So uh, that's how I got started. And you know, I, I'm not, it's kind of weird what happened that, you know, Mike was showing Kumiko on his Instagram. I was showing it on my Instagram and it just kind of exploded. And all of a sudden, like people were calling me and saying, Hey, could you come teach that here? So, uh, I started, you know, I'd already been doing a much more just on my own experimentation, making different patterns, went out, started teaching, uh, And then after I left the magazine, I started working with another publisher, and he uh, tried to convince me a a number of times to write a book about Kumiko, and eventually he did. (laughs) So so my book, The Art of Kumiko, came out, um, I think, pre-pandemic, so maybe 2019, something like that, Uh, maybe 2020. Sounds sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so really, it's just kind of, it's got a life of its own, sort of. Uh, so many people enjoy making it, uh, using it in their furniture, using it as a decorative element in their homes. And uh, people really seem to enjoy taking classes, learning how to do it. Yeah. And was Kamiko your, your first entry into teaching, or do you teach other things before that? Yeah, I've been teaching woodworking. Well, I've sort of been teaching in the general sense for a very long time. I... Uh, before I worked at Fine Woodworking Magazine, I was a college professor. Okay. So I taught philosophy, and I also taught the Greek language some, and ancient Greek language, and classics and stuff like that. So uh, I've always wanted to be a teacher, and initially that was I wanted to be a college philosophy professor. Okay. Uh, but I left that behind to work at the magazine, and... About two years after I started there, I guess, I got a call from a woodcraft store in Connecticut that had a, has a, had a school. That store's not in existence anymore. Um, and they asked if I'd like to come down and teach a class. So I went and taught a class on box making. Okay. That yeah. was the first class I ever taught. And to this day, I still teach a lot of box making classes. But I also teach classes on cabinetry and joinery. Um and uh, I guess those would be the main things that I teach. It's usually like a wall cabinet or a tea cabinet. Uh, it could be a technique-driven class, so like a couple of different ways to cut dovetails, um, or uh, it's boxes in Kumiko. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently, with you, did a box design class where students came in and were able to work through the design philosophy of boxes and figure out how to design an idea that they had, worked through that process, picked lumber, went to the lumber yard, and built those in the course of a week. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, you know, to help on the first day to help the students uh, improve their own, like, sketching ability, skills, under, better understand what goes into designing something like a box, and then taking them to the lumber yard and helping them pick out lumber and talk about, you know, why this board with its grain may not work for their particular box and things like that. Yeah, that class was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What did you see? Just, just curious as as someone coming from the north side of the United States down to the south side, the difference in lumber was that different, weird, confusing? Well, it was certainly different. Uh, I mean, it wasn't confusing, but um, yeah, in New England and Connecticut, I have access to amazing North American hardwoods. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're everywhere: cherry, walnut. Uh, white oak, mm -hmm. uh, northern red oak, which is attractive, mm -hmm. unlike southern red oak, which okay. is not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, you know, basswood, you know, maple, everything. Um, and uh, so that's sort of what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. That's like Those are like my local hardwoods. Um, and down here, of course, those uh, woods are not as prevalent. Mm -hmm. So the place that we went to uh, harvest lumber mm -hmm. has mostly stuff that is harvested from the city of Austin, right? right. Places yeah. in Austin. So it was a lot of pecan and mesquite. Uh, and they have some really beautiful Douglas fir that came out of a cistern, yeah. a water cistern. On, at, Testing from, sonar and audio signals at UT. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's some really beautiful stuff. So... You know, it's very uh, beautiful woods were available. The students did a great job picking stuff out. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they made yeah. really nice boxes. Yeah, we had different types of boxes and pencil boxes, urns, things like that. Mm -hmm. It all turned out really well. Do you think boxes are your favorite thing to make or you like the Kamiko more or larger furniture? What's kind of your go-to that you enjoy the most? Well, I do enjoy making boxes. I, there's something about the fact that I can design something, make it, apply a finish to it, and have it be done in, like, two days, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Um, but I probably, I really enjoy making tea cabinets because it's like making furniture. Uh, there's a lot of intricate work that goes into a lot of detail, but it's still small scale, so it's not going to take me three months to make something. Yeah. And I can incorporate things like Kumiko and fabric and milk paint uh, and other multi, you know, other media like thread and things like that that I like enjoy using in my work. So I like small cabinetry, you know, wall cabinets, tea cabinets, 
things like that. But I, you know, I've certainly made uh, a number of large pieces uh, and I enjoy that too. Uh, uh, it's just that, yeah, like I said, it's, it's, they're more time consuming. So, and also I have kind of a small shop. So if I have a big credenza in my shop, there's not much room for anything else, including me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's the stuff I like to make. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've been in Austin for a few days so far. What, or even on past trips, what's your favorite part about Austin so far? Wow. Um, well, Austin's a great city. I mean, I love teaching, of course. I come here to teach. So I, let's just we'll say the number one thing is coming here to teach. <laughs> that was the right answer. That was the right that was answer. what I was expecting. <laughs> but when I'm not teaching, I mean, it's there's so many good places to eat. You know, if you come to Austin and you don't eat tacos and barbecue, you're not doing it right. I mean, you've got it. That's what you've got to eat when you're here, right? Sure. Uh, So there's a lot of great tacos and barbecue to eat. Uh, There's a lot of places you can go see good music just about any night of the week. Mm -hmm. So I've enjoyed going out to see music. And um, I mean, really, when I'm here, I've always been here to work. So I've never really had much time to Mm -hmm. go out and do anything. Although this trip, I did spend one day uh, going around the city with my girlfriend, buying used records, uh, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Nice, nice. What do you have going on in your your shop right now? Any pr- big projects you're working on? Uh, well, right now I'm trying to finish up. Every now and then I do what I, I guess I call it a group buy mm-hmm. uh, through my Instagram account, and I'll say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to make this box. It's if I can get enough people to buy it, I can sell it at a price much lower than I normally would." Mm-hmm. So I did that, and I ended up with like 65 or 70 boxes sold which is probably a little too many. Okay. Uh, So right now I'm trying to get that done, but that was complicated by a non-woodworking hand injury. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A a baking related accident. (laughs) Sort of a baking, a moving baking equipment accident. Yeah. Uh, I fractured my finger and it it was a compound fracture. It's really uh, quite bad. Uh, So I actually have someone, a trusted uh, person finishing those boxes for me. Um, and after that, uh, I do have a commission to finish up, but then I'm going to, uh, finish a credenza for my office at home and make a console for my stereo equipment. So those I'm really looking forward to doing those things. And I have some chairs to make for my sunroom. Okay. So I'm hearing a lot of projects for yourself. That's a bit bit rare for a (laughs) furniture maker to be making things for themselves. It is. It's nice, though. Uh, it's nice. I think I'll have the time to do these things. I'm not 100% certain, but I think I will. Yeah. Um, you know, my time gets split between three things, really. Teaching, writing, and making co- and selling commission. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm usually able... So I'm not unlike, a, you know, someone who only makes furniture for a living and mm-hmm. sells, you know... I usually do have some free time because it's sort of built into my schedule so that I can do things like go away and teach or write a, a book, another mm-hmm. book or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, like two of those three that you mentioned are very focused on, on educating other people. Is that something you feel strongly about coming from the education sector or you just you enjoy the act of doing it or you believe kind of more in the holistic philosophy of education? Well, I, I, as I did mention, I do have always enjoyed teaching. Uh, for me, so when I was a freshman in college, I second semester, I took a philosophy course. And it really changed my life because all of a sudden, you know, not that I was a bad student in high school, but the way that they wanted you to think about the world was not necessarily the way that I think about the world. And when I took a philosophy class, all of a sudden things started to click for me. I became a way better student in all subjects, and um, it changed my life. It helped me. It also helped me sort of focus some of my uh, untrained energy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Sure. And uh, so I I wanted to be able to – I hoped that one day I could affect someone's life the way that my undergraduate professors affected mine. Mm -hmm. And – then, 
when I was a college professor, I had a student whose dad is a furniture maker in Camden, South Carolina, Mm -hmm. and he invited me out to a shop. And Joe, over the, you know, like two, two and a half year period, taught me the fundamentals, really taught me how to make furniture. Mm -hmm. I, I learned so much from him, and he never asked for anything back. And I, so I, I felt like, well, I need, I sort of owe the craft something. But I also, I just, I love it so much that I want other people to love it, right? Mm -hmm. I I think that if I can get someone in a classroom and show them how how much potential power they have Mm -hmm. in their hands and in their mind to create, that they'll love creating. And, you know, uh, creating things, you know... it's sort of, in a way, what really distinguishes us from all the other animals is creativity. Mm-hmm. So I think that, that it allows you to become a, a, a more complete human being to really create stuff. And I want to share, I want to sort of get other people to feel that way, you know, because I think it would make for a better world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to teach because uh, it's, for all of those reasons, but also it's satisfying just to see someone who th- thinks that they can't do anything, right? Like, I'm a total beginner. I'm going to do nothing but mistakes. And then they walk out of the class with, like, a beautiful box or a beautiful Kumiko panel, and you can see it in their eyes that they're really happy. And, you know, that, fe- that feels good. It's, it's nice to do that for people. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah, we really like having students – all these classes and really love to see the evolution of them as a woodworker or furniture maker and having great instructors is definitely a major part of that Mm -hmm. and their passion is kind of equal to the excitement that students have in the class right yeah and you know there's some way in which you know I have kids so I've been teaching my kids for their whole lives Mm -hmm. you know and I was a college professor there's there's some way in which you can't escape teaching Mm -hmm. in life and whether that's in a formal setting or just you work in an office somewhere as a software engineer, mm-hmm. in some fashion, you're going to have to be teaching someone something. So I think it's something that is sort of natural to our a part of all of us. It may mm-hmm. not be natural to all of us, sure. but it's a part of all of us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, it's just a, it's a very fulfilling activity. Yeah. I agree. Well, in closing, I'm, I've been trying to run through my head of like a podcast type question. And the only thing I could think of was if you were a woodworking tool, what would you be? Philip Morley? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, if I was a woodworking tool, which one would I be? Wow. Well, I always, so this is not, I'm not going to answer your question. I will. I, I'll get to it. But so, <laughs> Answer with another question. No, no, no. This is, People ask me, like, oh, what's your favorite tool or what do you think is the most important tool in the mm-hmm. shop? Yeah. And I always say that what's enabled me, if I am successful in, as a woodworker, what's enabled me to be successful isn't any of the tools I own. It's patience. It's, you know, being able to clear my mind and focus. Mm-hmm. It's a willingness to learn you know, a desire to learn, to improve, to expand my knowledge. Um, It's, you know, a desire to be creative. But those are all the things that allow me to be successful in the shop and I think successful as a teacher. Um, That being said, probably one of my favorite tools is going to either be my Lee Nielsen number uh, one inch wide bench chisel. Mm -hmm. I use it all the time. Or it's going to be one of my layout tools, one of my little mini layout tools. Okay. So, uh, because layout is so critical. Uh, if you do bad layout, you're going to have bad furniture. You know? But the same could be said of milling. So maybe it's my Oliver 166 12 inch joiner. You know, milling is such a critical part of uh, making furniture that uh, if you don't do it properly, you don't make good furniture. I don't know if I have a favorite tool. I just, I like them all. Yeah. You know, but I also sort of view it, I'm the kind of person that says a tool is a tool. You know, that's all it is. Mm-hmm. It's a t- it al- and a good tool is one that allows you to work and doesn't get in the way. It becomes an extension of your mind and of your body. 
and you forget about it in a sense, right? So because it's not it's not causing you to struggle and it's not get, you know frustrating you. It's simply allowing you to do that thing that you see in your head, you know. So that's but that's kind of the way I think about it. I never say that I'm a hand tool woodworker or a power tool worker or even worse, a hybrid woodworker. <laughs> I'm just, a fr- I love to make furniture. And that's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. And so if I need to do something and the smartest way to do it is with a shaper origin, I'm going to use my shaper origin. If the smartest way to do it is with, uh, you know, like a lineal, my lineal sin number four, I'm going to use my lineal sin number four. That's, uh, you know, that's the way I think about furniture making. That's mm-hmm. the way I think about my time in the shop and what I do is that it has this larger goal of making beautiful things. And the tools that I have that allow me to do that are simply tools. Mm-hmm. Right. There are operations where hand tools are the best operation yes. for that. Yeah. And sometimes machines are. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Some, yeah. So it's, uh, I always, I just appreciate a, a tool that lets me do the work I want to do. Yeah. Well, if everybody wants to email you, call you and ask you why you don't like being a hybrid woodworker, <laughs> how do they find you on the internet? Uh, well, I'll say it's not that I, I just don't like the term hybrid woodworker <laughs> because it somehow is like this idea that this is a new and no, that's just woodworking. Yeah. That's just woodworking. Um, on Instagram, I'm at M-E-K Woodworks. On Twitter, I'm at M-E-K Woodworks. On Facebook, I'm at M-E-K Woodworks. And my website is M-E-K Woodworks.com. All right. And that is actually how it is pronounced, not mech. A lot of people say, are you mech Woodworks? And I say, no, I'm not. I'm M-E-K Woodworks. Those are my initials. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And hopefully you'll... Like and subscribe. Check us out. If you want to take some woodworking classes, come by the Austin School of Furniture. I'm sure at some point in time, Matt will be back teaching some classes. So hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks so much, everybody.